Welcome to Vendetta Sports Media. This is Eight Sided Freaks. And today we are here with a pay per view preview. It is the Thursday out from uh, UFC 309. So we're just a couple days away from the event. And it's a pay per view preview. It's nothing too complex. We've got five main card fights. We're going to break down all five main card fights. And at the end, we'll do some final thoughts for some of the prelims. There will be uh, much more brief discussions about the fights that stand out to us. We won't even talk about all the prelims. Um, but the big fights, the big main card fights, we're going in depth on, giving our thoughts, opinions, and a pick on the fight. That is the plan for today. And that will probably be centered mostly around uh, the top two fights. John Jones versus Steve Miocic, Charles Oliveira Mike versus Michael Chandler. A lot to get into with both of those. And that's where we'll start, right at the top, or as Michael Chandler would say, see you at the top. Um, John Jones versus Stipe Miocic. Heavyweight title on the line. Jerry, what are your thoughts coming into this? Just from an excitement or an intrigue perspective, because this, this is a fight with a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns. You know, this is John's second fight at heavyweight. He's... Got hurt, had to pull out the first time these two were booked. Consensus greatest of all time, Stipe Miocic. Probably the best UFC heavyweight of all time. Some people say Fedor is the better heavyweight all time. But as far as UFC goes, Stipe is the gold standard of the heavyweight division in most people's eyes. So legacies on the line. A little bit of issues with both guys in terms of age or inactivity and things like that. So where are you in terms of excitement and some of those outside factors? Uh, coming into this main event to say i'm pumped about this fight would be an understatement i am very intrigued in a lot of aspects but just the namesake john jones is back second fight at heavyweight can't wait to see what he does again anytime john jones is fighting it's well 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 worth watching and if you don't i'm sorry i hope you have a good reason not to stipe we know what he's done in the heavyweight division we know as you said he's arguably the best ufc heavyweight of all time Sure, it was rough last time against Francis Ngannou, but that was three years ago, three and a half years ago, really. That's where my intrigue comes in, is what? We saw what John did last year, and I'm sure it'd be a very similar shape, John. I know he had his surgery in the time off and did have to pull out of that first fight. They were scheduled. But Stipe hasn't fought in so long that I'm really, really curious to see how he does. There's a point where he was fighting – couple times a year i look at 2016 where he fought three times ended up winning the belt and defending it in that year since then he only fought twice in 2018 take it for what it is it's been a long time since his last fight which was 2021 of march against francis Ngannou, and i just i don't know what shape he's going to be that is my big question mark and i think that's a lot of people's question marks that's what i think and i'm sure you'll you have the betting odds pulled up at somewhere but Seems like he's a very, very heavy underdog in this fight, with rightfully so. There is a chance he comes out and looks like the Stipe Miocic we remember and all loved watching in the heavyweight division. There's also a chance he shows that he is a 42-year-old that hasn't fought in three and a half years. That's where my intrigue is on it. Yeah, and you know what? I think this fight is so interesting from an intrigue perspective and a how-much-should-we-care perspective because – I think you can really damper this down when you say, you know, John, at this point in his career, I don't think is as good as he was, we'll say, three years, four, however many years you want to say. He's not as good as he used to be. Um, Steve Bates, 43. I believe 40. Yeah, 43. 42. 42. Yeah, 42. Yeah. Yeah. But 42, coming off a uh, knockout loss for three years ago and it's a very interesting thing to think about and there's reasons you could just look at it from that perspective and say why should i care but at the same time once again you could also say i'd rather see both these guys fight aspinall and i think that's more compelling and i think that is i think both of those are legitimate points um and i wouldn't argue against those but i do think those points have kind of overshadowed a very compelling matchup mm -hmm. and I don't know what state, what, what we're going to I have no clue what to expect from these guys. Um, come Saturday, 
but I do think there's a chance we get like a sensational, sensational uh, fight. I like I I'm not sure that it's the most likely outcome, but I do think it's a very real possibility um, that we get some high level stuff, and and that is very intriguing to me. Um, and even you know even if we get the worst outcome and both these guys look wa- look washed up and looks like they both need to retire, that's it's still important from a legacy perspective. You know, John's got that one loss that is you know only against uh that was only a dq you know you don't want to go out there you know whether you're washed up or not you don't want to go out there and put that first legit loss on the on the record so i think it's a very important fight and it could end up being a great fight but i i like i said i think there's a or like i've alluded to i think there's a wide range of outcomes that we could get on saturday and i think that makes it interesting um in my opinion and that's what i'm looking at and like you said, betting odds, um, I'll throw those out there now since you mentioned them. Uh, right now, it's some of these heavier favorites. It's tough to find an average line because places like to blow it out. Um, but we'll say minus 670 on FanDuel uh, for John Jones plus 430 uh, for Stipe. That kind of shifts and change because when you get the wide odds, some people will give you plus 400 on the underdog and some places will have, you know, more chalk on the side of the favorite, depending on how much they like to play it. But it is worth noting that line has dipped significantly. I saw plus 500 on steep eight throughout the week. So that has come down. Um, even if you're, you know, only getting to the plus 430 mark, it's still, you know, still a big underdog on the steep eight side, but it has dropped. So I think that is intriguing that there's, at least spend some betting interest on Stipe, given the number, which I think is reflective of, like I mentioned, a fight where there's a lot of possible outcomes. In that type of fight, I'd rather have the guy who's plus 430, just if you don't consider names or legacies or anything like that. Yeah, and I mean, who knows what Stipe's going to be like, because give me this fight four years ago. Holy shit. We are in for one of the best fights of all time, I would assume. Down the line, it's a lot less, a lot less predictable. We don't know how John's going to look in his second UFC day fight or second heavyweight fight, following all his injury issues. We don't know how Stipe is going to look, and that does open it up for a wide range of vari- variables and different varieties of what can happen in this fight. And I honestly, I know we'll get our predictions here at some point, but like, I'm just thinking down the line. I don't know when you do the actual preview, written preview with all of our picks and predictions. Kind of have a good idea for the other ones. This one, I have no idea off the top of my head yet. It's going to be a game time decision just because I can see it going so many different ways. Yeah. And one thing that you have talked about a couple times is the shape and John's injuries. And I really wish I'm looking for the picture right now and trying to do both at the same time. I can't find it, but there, someone um, did the Lord's work and posted a side by side of John. Um, you know, they take the pictures before, um, during fight week. And someone compared John to his fight against Gan and John to this fight. And I will say, John looks to be in significantly better shape mm-hmm. um, just from the media picture. And those don't always mean everything. Well, most of the time, they mean nothing. But I do think it's a lot more. I think if there's any place it matters, I think it's a heavyweight division. Because you have so much room to go up and down and bounce and body weight. When you look at the guys below Michael Chandler and Charles Oliveira, they got to get down to 155 regardless. Mm -hmm. These heavyweights, especially guys like Stipe, who aren't at that 265 limit, have a lot of room to go. Stipe could have came in here fat. Um, And Stipe is in good shape as well. Uh, I will add that because... You know, he could have been out for three years and came back with a little bit more belly fat than you'd be expecting. And it could be a completely, you know, lesser version. So I think from that perspective, um, I'll read a little bit more into those pictures than I usually do and say both of them are looking to be in good shape. And that provides some optimism that we're going to get a good fight on Saturday. Um, And it also makes it harder to pick because when I see both these guys looking good, what should I think of these guys? You know, should I think, oh, it's going to be prime John Jones out there? Or, oh, I think Stipe is going to look rejuvenated after, you know, his three-year layoff. Like, 
it's just a lot of, but I don't really want to have those opinions. You know what I mean? I don't want to be that optimistic on either side. Um, but I think there are reasons for, uh, for that optimism. So um, I will add that. And I kind of want to go into the thoughts on the fight itself, because I do think this is an interesting one to talk about from that perspective. Like you said, it's a tough one. Um, I have not written the preview for this fight. I do not know who I will be picking um, to win this fight straight up. I do think I'll probably have John to, I, I mean, I guess, but like, I think Stipe has got a legit chance here, but my overall point here is what are, when I'm trying to preview this fight and trying to write this and trying to make my decision, because I put a lot of thought into who I think is, is winning these fights, especially championship level fights. What should I base this off of? We've got John who has a has a guillotine choke win over Cyril Gan. That is two minutes and four seconds long of a fight. That is his only heavyweight fight. Prior to that, you have to go back to his five-round decision against Dominic Reyes in 2020. And then on the Stipe side of things, you have his knockout loss to Nganu. That came in March of 2021. And that... You got one full round and then 52 seconds into the next round. And he's fighting a pretty, and, and both of those matchups actually are pretty unique guys. Like fighting a Gan is different than fighting everyone else in the world. Fighting uh, Gan is a unique matchup for a guy like Jones, who is such a dominant grappler, he can just go out there and take him down. So I don't know, even of the things that we have seen from these guys in the last three, almost four years, you don't really have a lot of tape that is really applicable and for Stipe if you want to turn back the clock a little bit more now you're looking at the Daniel Cormier fights where DC from a size perspective is so much shorter than Stipe and John is he's going to come out here and try and use his length I assume when the fight is standing that is the complete opposite to DC so even if you wind the clock back you're getting much different types of fights to where it makes it very hard to say how each fighter matches up in, in comparison to the other one, in my opinion, at least. No, I'm with you completely. It's such a different style. And fighting against each of these two guys, it's completely different than anything you've seen before going off your point. I do think like the slight advantage is you look at, and this is leaning more towards the John side of things, is you look at who Steve Bates fought. You just said DC three times, Francis Ngani twice in his last five. We kind of know what Francis Ngani is going to come out and do, or try to do. We know he's going to come in and try and just knock your socks off. Ultimately got Stipe in that second round. DC, much more compact, much smaller, goes inside and tries to work you down a bit, get the takedown and go from there. He's sure he did get the knockout win over Stipe in 2018 in their first fight at heavyweight but it's just different in other words jones he's fought guys more similar in my opinion to the style of stipe i know it's not quite the same moving up a division but he's fought guys who are better strikers kind of similar-ish sizes of stipe i'm assuming he's going to be a little heavier than the guys but like tiago santos isn't exactly a small guy alexander gustafson's not exactly a small guy these are guys who have more physical attributes that I see in Stipe than I do with the guy's Stipe spot that I see in John Jones. If that makes sense. Like that's on the physical side of things in this fight. That's kind of one of the things I'm looking at. And if Stipe can kind of figure it out, John and use his boxing, use his strength to keep him away is there's a difference as well. John has one fight in heavyweight. Stipe's fought some of the best heavyweights in the world. Junior Dos Santos, Alistair Overeem, former champion, Andre Arlovsky at the time. It was, He's fought so many really talented guys in his career at heavyweight. And that's my other concern about John is he has one fight at heavyweight against a guy in Cyril Gon that personally I don't rate that well. Cyril Gon got beaten by Francis Ngannou on the ground. Francis Ngannou is in the ground. He got put out by John Jones in, what was it, two minutes and four seconds or something ridiculous like that. It's different. So I'm curious to see how John does against a true heavyweight that actually 
kind of goes forward. And this is also me thinking that Stipe is going to look even a hair like he used to and not look like a 42-year-old that hasn't fought in three years. Yeah, and, you know, I think that's a very good um, good point there with uh, with John. He has fought some guys previously that you could compare a little bit to um, Stipe. And I do have this uh, comparison for John um, for his size. I can only find it in Spanish. Um, but we're looking at the picture, so <laughs> we'll throw the picture up on the screen. Um, here, this is the uh, the size for John. He, which in my opinion, looks significantly better. Um, at this Look. current point, he's probably going to be a little bit lighter, a little yeah. bit fatter, which I think is uh, optimistic in my opinion. Yeah, he looks a lot more cut and kind of looks like he's figured out where to put all his muscle in at the heavyweight division. It seems like he's got the cut down a little more, and it just seems very different than what he did when he fought last was a year and a half ago. I am also a fan of the uh, John Jones custom shorts. Those remind oh, yeah. me of the old school uh, John when he was rocking the red, when he was yeah. like young, young. Um, so those are those are a good pair of custom shorts. I will say I don't so. dislike Stipe shorts with the Croatian emblem and the checkered pattern on it. I like yeah, that. Not bad as well. The Charles yeah. Oliveira ones are a little wonky in my opinion. They're a lot. Michael Chandler's are similar to Stipe's in terms of it's the yeah. blackish with the American flag mm-hmm. implemented in it. They kind of copy and pasted the Gaethje design as well. Yeah. They're like, oh, these guys are Americans. We got um, <laughs> yeah. But okay. Um Back on track from the styles here. I do think this is a really interesting fight because you're trying to figure out where Stipe has success. He's a great boxer. Um, Mm -hmm. He, he, in straight boxing exchanges, he throws in combination a decent amount. He isn't like going to go out there and rip off a six piece, but he'll throw one twos. He'll throw hooks on the inside. um, He'll rip to the body. He'll go body head hurt. DC bad with punches to the body. Um, he's also very underrated going backwards, sitting down on some counters. Um, he's knocked out some guys who were getting aggressive with him um, by sitting down on counters. Uh, he landed a really good counter against Nganu as well, but, um, he landed the counter and then Nganu landed a punch that was a much more damaging, uh, than the counter that Stipe landed. So Stipe has got very serious boxing skills, but. I think the one thing that really swings me to John is I think his movement is going to be better. It is a spot where I'm concerned because we haven't really seen him, you know, the John that was in there against Ghana was a little tubbier and a little bit, you know, that's kind of why like I brought the picture up because I do think he's a little bit slimmer. I think that'll think that'll help him move. And I think that's the one thing at this point in Steve A's career that I don't love. I think he's a little bit more stationary. I don't think he's quite as evasive. I think he kind of has to stay in the pocket. So I think John is going to have an advantage with simplest thing as as it comes down to like foot speed, getting in and out of exchanges, in and out of range for a guy who also is going to go out there and throw oblique kicks and he's going to land jabs. He's going to use his length. Um, I think that is a spot where I think John is going to separate himself on the feet um, because otherwise I think Stipe would have success standing in his face and boxing. Um, but I don't think he's going to get those opportunities just from a movement perspective. I don't think John will be there to be hit um, as much as um, Stipe would like. I also think John will be able to crash inside, get to the clinch, and land some shots out of the clinch. John's a very good clinch fighter. Um, I don't know if John will wrestle here. Um, he that might. Was, that was going to be my next question to you is yeah. like, because we know John Jess Jones' wrestling background and his prowess, and we saw it against Cyril Gaon. Do you think he uses it against Stipe? And it sounds like you aren't sure on that. I'm I'm not, because Stipe is a very hard guy to take down. Yeah. But I will say, if John gets the takedown, I think he would have a lot of success in top position. If he like lands a takedown in the open and has Stipe on his back, I think he would have a lot of success with ground and pound, with submissions, with things like that. Getting him to the ground will not be easy. Can yeah. John do it? Yeah, he's an amazing wrestler. He probably can do it. But I just think, like, 
going out there and wrestling someone as big and as tough to wrestle as Stipe, if he's having enough success staying on the outside, getting into the clinch, and then once he gets to the clinch, you know, kind of show some takedowns, mix in some elbows, some knees, because DC has success with that. When he knocked him out, he was coming out of the clinch. So mm-hmm. I think that may be a spot that John has success to where if he can dictate the outside distance enough and find success in the clinch, I'm not sure that he's going to go have to go out there and wrestle. He might, but I'm just not convinced um, that it's like something he has to do. So I think it's really interesting to see what John's going to do because he is, you know, well-rounded enough to mix it up. Yeah, and that's what um, I, I can see takedowns becoming into play later on in the fight if this is to go four or five rounds. I think you could use those t- mm-hmm. takedowns to kind of swing momentum one way or another, but it's one of those things that, like you said, Stipe's a tough guy to take down. My interest with John Jones in this is definitely his striking style. Is he going to be quick? Is he going to be agile? Because we didn't see that against Cyril Gaon, who – it was mar- remarked as the top striker in the heavyweight. The way he moves is unlike anything else we've seen. I can see John moving really well, and I'm curious to see how he uses kicks and that aspect of stuff. Is Does he use a kick to set up the takedowns? Is he using leg kicks, high head kicks? I want to see a lot of shots to the body in this one from both guys as well because I think that's an underrated area. You always think, oh, let's go for the legs or go for the head to knock his head off. No, body shots do just as much damage and wear you down more. So that's another intrigue aspect. So I don't know which way this fight's going to go. I'm just excited to see two of the best of all time go at it, even if it was four years, five years too late. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, And like you said, I agree with your, with your point about the body shots. And, you know, I, I wonder what John would look like at this point in his career getting late into a fight. It's, it, I'm very curious about that because, you know, he when he was at 205, he never had a problem with cardio. Mm. Never, ever. Won the late rounds against Reyes in his most recent light heavyweight fight. Um, but at this point in his career, he's simply carrying more weight. Makes it harder to go 25 minutes. Um, so I would love to see both these guys um, go to the body. And for John... John really doesn't have that good of hands. You know, you look over the course of his career. Yeah. It's, it's he doesn't really have a lot of knockout knockouts, period, to be honest with you. His last knockout was Chael Sonnen in 2013. That he, there's got to be one before that. Oh, it was Gustafson in, in 2018. My bad. Um, but point there is. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And Chael Sonnen at that point in his career was just, oh, retitle fight. Okay. <laughs> you know, that was, that's not the best guy he's ever fought. Is uh, I love Chael, still, but I thought he was still undefeated at that point. <laughs> <laughs> he's lucky that fight didn't get to the end of the end of the first round, or John would have been out of there with his uh, broken toe. It would have been, right. it would have been another loss on the, on the record. Um, <laughs> but yeah, even before that, um, he took out Shogun, hurt him with hands, finished him with the knee. Um, and there's just not very many, you know, he hurt Lyoto Machida with a punch. Um, so I'll give him that, but throughout his career, he's not out here dropping guys with, with boxing combinations. Um, and when he got DC, it was a head kick. Um, I glanced over that one cause it was a no contest. Um, but he knocked him out with a head kick. Basically that's what he hurt him with. Right. So I think that is an issue for John in this fight is there isn't really much finishing upside um, with the hands. But that being said, I think he's going to have the advantage with the kicks and with the elbows and with the knees. I think he's going to be better in those three areas of striking. Um, while Stipe has got the boxing advantage and John's got long legs. And if he still has any dexterity, um, one of the problems with Stipe's movement that we were just that I was just referring to is, oh, if you're not moving that great and now you're just getting blasted with sidekicks, you know, that kind of presents a, some troubles. And John will um, throw those kicks to the body and he will throw the leg kicks as well. But, you know, that's a great way to dig to the body is throwing that sidekick and throwing teeps. And those are things that John will will do. So I think those are um, areas that John could have success. So um, as far as my prediction goes, I'm taking John. I'm probably going to take decision 
here. Um, kind of, like I said earlier, range. I was striking at range, avoiding the interior boxing exchanges, getting to the clinch, maybe, maybe mixing in some takedowns. Um, I'm not convinced that he finishes. Um, so I, 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 t- I think it's going to be a John decision win. Um, and, you know, I kind of really had to talk myself into that, if this makes sense. Mm-hmm. I've wanted to take Stipe, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I still may bet Stipe at the betting odds number of plus 430 or whatever it was north of plus 400. I think the odds are still a little ridiculous. Um, but as far as a straight pick goes, I think it's John Decision. I may even bet, you know, John Decision decision, and Stipe is such a big underdog. You can do that as a, a small hedge in case he gets finished. So that may be the way I approach the fight from like a betting perspective. But um, John Decision is probably going to be my pick here. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was leaning to, just because I don't know if he would be he's gonna take him down and all that method of madness. There's a reason it's I, I will say I'm surprised. At least the one I'm looking at the betting site, John Jones by decision is plus four hundred. For him by knockout is plus one twenty. So I guess the books think he's gonna knock out Steve Ham. He's only been knocked out three times in his career. That's not an easy thing to do. Francis Ngannou, we know the power. We talked about that. DC got it done. And then his only other knockout loss was Stefan Stinger, who he's he's a tricky guy to fight. He's so tall. It's, it's, it's so it's hard. A it's weird just matchup. A freaky matchup for yeah. Well, exactly what you just said. Like those are not bad knockout losses to guys who are very good or very freaky in their own way. At the same time, I don't see Stipe going out and flattening out John Jones, but. I'm going to put some money on it, that's for sure. I'm going to hedge my way just because I don't think Stipe wins a decision. I think if he's to win, this fight will go into four, the fourth or fifth round and he'll land something because maybe John's not prepared for a five-round fight. But end of the day, I think I'm going to lean John, whether it is a finish or a decision yet to be determined, right? The second I'm leaning towards a decision based on everything we've kind of talked about and how the trends have been in the past, but... It wouldn't surprise me if he comes out and does finish Stipe at all, just because 42 years old off the couch for three years. That's Once what I was going to say. If he can survive those first couple punches and be like, okay, I'm back, then we have us a fight. But it's that what if and that question mark surrounding it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think as far as the betting odds go um, for the knockout for John, I think it's a lot of – predicting which i think is a is the smart way to bet you don't want to bet based on what happened in the past you want to bet on what's going to happen on saturday uh that's how you win bets um and i think it's just very um predicting that that chin isn't going to be able to hold up at 42 and i get it i do um and john is also such a prolific guy when he's on top right there's a reason that when we're talking about knockouts, we had to list a couple ground and pound stoppages. Um, because if he can get in top position and start raining down elbows, he will. And especially now that the 12 6 is legal. I was just gonna say that. I think I would not be surprised if John gets in top and just says, I think John's such a maniac that I think John will, you know, I want to win this fight with 12 to 6 elbows. Okay. I genuinely believe if he gets to mount, he's gonna just throw the 12 to 6 elbow until he gets the stoppage. He got DQ'd for the 12 to 6. He wants the first guy, he wants to be the first guy to win the fight via ground and pound via 12 to 6 elbow. I am very oh, I don't think that's a question at all. No. Knowing John Jones. And that's that's another question I have about with like Stipe's chin is if it doesn't hold up in terms of say he gets popped a couple times and then drops. It's not like John's gonna let him get back up. He's gonna be on top of him trying to get into that full mount right away and land some brutal elbows. There's a reason he was John Bones Jones. It's because he is mm-hmm. bony as hell and will slice you open. So Yeah. And John has good finishing instincts mm-hmm. as well. Smells, um smells that blood in the water. Yeah. When when I, when we were talking earlier and I said John doesn't have many finishes, well, he didn't he wasn't letting guys off the hook. You could argue fights were closer than they should have been with guys like Tiago Santos and Ovin St. Pru. Some of those guys fights were closer than they should have been. But if John has somebody hurt or those guys want the door, 
John takes him right to the door and throws him out. Like, John doesn't play when it comes finish time, whether it be the finish against DC or Surreal that had a little bit of quit and he showed him that quit, or he hurt Lyota Machida with a shot. And next thing you know, you're in a guillotine and he, he damn near kill, like, killed Lyota Machida with that guillotine. It's one of the nastiest submissions of all time. So if, if John sees a chance to get the finish, he is still a finisher. He still wants to hurt people. I don't doubt that one bit. Uh, all right. Let's jump down to the co-main event now. Speaking of violence and finishers and smelling blood in the water, Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler. No doubt in my mind that these guys are going to give us a fight. You know, I'm not exactly sure what we're getting from the Chandler side because a lot of the same questions we just had for some of, you know, John and Stipe, it's not the same. I'm not going to say it's the same. But, man, I've got some questions with Chandler. He has been sidelined. He has been waiting for a fight with Conor McGregor. And the thing that nobody has talked about, or I shouldn't say nobody, the thing that I have not seen enough discussion of is the fact that he was preparing for two years for a fight with Conor McGregor that was supposed to be at 170, and now he's got to come back down to 155. Um I think that is a massive, massive, massive question mark. Mm-hmm. Inserting, we have seen him hit on the chin, and we have seen him knocked out, and we have seen him tired. And I don't think that uh, drop down from 170 to 155 helps either of those massive concerns that I have with Michael Chandler. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, he was, how close was he to beating Oliveira the first time? There's no reason he can't go out there and land some shots and get it done this time. So I think this is a very compelling fight. Um, And I don't think you ever truly know what you're going to get out of Chandler and to a similar extent, Oliveira. So before I toss it over to you, I'll shout out the betting odds here. Right now we're looking at looks like an average line. I'd say is about plus 210 on the Chandler side. Oliveira minus 260 that also has dropped a little bit but that's dropped from you know 225 from 230 down to 210 so a little bit of love on the Chandler side of things but it has been a slight drop not a massive pile downwards so um co-main event also five five minute rounds we got a five rounder here not a three rounder so Mention that as well before I throw it over to you. I highly doubt we're going to need all 25 minutes of this fight. I'm just putting that one out there first. <laughs> you look at who these guys have fought last in like their kind of fights. Michael Chandler's last fight, Dustin Poirier back in 2022. Two years ago to the day of a couple days ago, November 12th, submitted in the third round. Before that, it was the front kick every Tony Ferguson fan wants to forget. 17 seconds into the second round, knockout cold. I'm amazed the Gaethje fight didn't end in a not in a finish the way they were throwing at it, but that was a three-round fight, went the distance. And it was the Oliveira one that could have been done. In the first round, Chandler could have won it in the first round, ended up losing in the second. And that kind of brings me back to what I'm expecting for this fight is I expect pure chaos like that first fight of them just going at each other Maybe some takedown attempts from both guys. Chandler's got a strong wrestling background. Oliver is one of the best jiu-jitsu fighters in the world. He also knows how to throw a mean punch. And he, I don't. I think he losing to Islam awoken something new. I'm still not entirely convinced he lost to Armin Sarukian. I have no real complaints about the decision. It was one of those things. I need to go back and watch that because I watched it a couple months ago, but haven't really seen it this week as much. I'm very, very, very curious to see what Chandler is, just because of what you said earlier. You're preparing two years to fight Conor McGregor at 170. Now you're suddenly changing and flipping, not suddenly like it's a week's notice or something, but you now have to focus on Charles Oliveira, 155. I think it's safe to say, and you can tell me if I'm completely wrong, 
I don't see virtually any similarities in one preparing for Conor McGregor and one preparing, <laughs> preparing for Charles Oliveira. I don't think there's much similarity in those two game plans. So that that concerns me a bit is he focused so much on this one guy and focused on tuning in these skills for a year and a half. And not that he doesn't have the skills the other way around, but now it's like now you're focusing on a different guy with completely different danger zones. And you look at Michael Chandler. He's been submitted before last time by rear naked choke against Dustin Poirier, who was submitted by Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira has one of the best rear naked chokes in the UFC, especially in this lightweight division. And if he gets onto your back, it's there's not much you can do about it. That's where I'm looking for this fight to go. I'm expecting this fight. While we talked about it with the Jones and Stipe, wanted that it might go as a last minute kind of thing. I expect this one to be a lot more on the ground from the get-go. I think there will be some really good striking exchanges, but I expect this one to be won or lost on the ground. Yeah. And I, you know, that you, you always hear no rematch is the same as the first fight. And as many fights as we see rematches, that holds true that people don't just say that that holds uh, true. See very different iterations of fights every time it's booked. Um, look at Roy Vall, or excuse me, look at Pantoja and Moreno, for example. They fought four times, and we got four very different fights out of that. Um, and I look and I think, how is a fight between Michael Chandler and Charles Oliveira gonna play out? I think the first, what the way the first fight played out is is would be my number one, like, I think this is what happens. You know, Chandler comes out. He's going to swing hammers. He's going to land on a guy who gets hit. Does Oliveira recover? Yes or no. And then he recovers, so he wins. If he didn't recover, he would have lost. Yep. And I think we could see that again. But at the same time, like I just said, no fight is ever the same. And if I'm looking at this for these two guys – what would I do to try and change it up? And if, I think the most obvious guy that could pen, potentially do that is Charles Oliveira. Mm -hmm. Chandler is the guy with the wrestling background. But in the first fight, Oliveira was the guy who landed the double leg takedown and got on top and worked to the back in the first round. He did not submit Michael Chandler mm -hmm. um, in the first round of that fight. But he got to the back, and that started with him attempting a – low double leg, which is something that he rarely, rarely does. Usually when he's attempting takedowns, it is, you know, out of the clinch because he has a dangerous clinch game. Um, and maybe that's something we see here from him. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Oliveira use that clinch game where he can throw some knees to the body. He killed Poirier with knees to the body. If anyone ever wants a demonstration on how you mix martial arts in 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 terms of clinch and BJJ, that is a great one. And you could say the the Oliveira versus Gaethje fight as well. Um, that that's a sensational mixing of the martial arts as well. But I think that is something we say we may see a little bit more of here. Oliveira going to the clinch, looking to land knees in the clinch. What's Chandler going to do in the clinch? Take him down. Okay. Now we're playing jujitsu on the ground either way, and that gives Oliveira a chance to sweep. So I think that is how I see this fight changing the most is Oliveira takedowns, Oliveira clinch, and just more grappling exchanges. Because if you're Charles, you get hit heavy a lot, a, a lot, a lot. Um, and it being against Chandler, maybe you just want to avoid some of those shots. You're a little bit older than you were when you fought the first time. And for as much as we see Oliveira get hit, he hasn't really been hit bad in a few fights. So I'm not saying he wouldn't be able to recover as well this time. I'm just saying this isn't like you're going from Poirier to Gaethje. And we just saw in the last fight, you recovering from getting hit. You know, we saw the Sarukian fight. We saw the Daryush fight. There's a couple fights in there where we haven't really seen him get hit clean. And he has hit that 35 mark. Um, the other fights were probably when he was about 33. So there's a big difference there. Um, in terms of recoverability and chin. So I'd like to see more grappling, long story short, um, from the Oliveira side, considering he's got the most submissions in UFC history. Let's use them. Yep. 
and I'm with you. And I think that also the first fight showed us that Oliveira, and we've seen it time and time again, he gets hit and he goes down. Usually he waits for the guy to come down with him, and most people don't. I don't think Chandler would be one to go down with him in this situation. The only one who did was Islam, and there's a reason Islam beat him the way he did in the second round. So I like that shout of Oliveira using more of a ground game because it also eliminates a lot of Michael Chandler's power, which is in his stand-up and his striking boxing especially. So I, I – and I'm leaning towards that of a Charles Oliveira submission is my pick in this one. That's kind of where I'm at right now. It might change in the days leading up, but I just feel like he's the submission leader in the UFC for a reason. And he looked like he could have gotten one in that first fight. I think he takes advantage of it the second fight. Yeah. And, and you know, maybe he doesn't even have to submit him. I, I think my pick for this fight will be Charles Oliveira's submission. But for him to get a win, if I'm him, I'm not even that concerned about getting that early submission. You just got to grapple enough in that first round to make those shots don't not hurt as bad in the second round. Like, at a minimum, if you just spend the whole first round grappling, and we've seen Chandler. Like, worst case, like, Chandler, go ahead. Take me, like, if you're Charles, go ahead, take me down, do that thing where you lift me above my head and slam me. Then what, what's, what's going to happen? You're going to get tired, and I'm going to get up. Like when Chandler slammed Gaethje is one of the funniest things of all time because and they show that replay in his highlight reel they cut that thing quick as shit because Gaethje got up <laughs> he wasn't able to hold Gaethje because he threw him so hard and then he's tired from throwing him um so like I just think grappling period even if it's just you know you got to survive uh one round to make those massive swings from Chandler at least hurt worse um and. Also, the fact that this is three or five five minute rounds, I think that helps Oliveira. I don't know what Oliveira looks l late in fights, but I, I I've seen him in a third round and I've seen how he's looked in a third round, and you can compare that to how Chandler's looked in a third round, and you favor what you've seen from Oliveira in round three. So I would think that the later this goes, the more it favors Charles, even if Charles isn't in you know sensational shape. I just think that he will be in better shape from a cardio perspective for late rounds. When we're talking who would win a decision, I think it would be much more applicable for Chandler to steal two of three in a three-round fight than it is for him to take three of five in a five-round fight. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. I do think the five rounds benefits Oliveira because... I... I don't know. It just seems like he has the more game style to last five rounds and be effective in that fourth and fifth round than Chandler. Could be and, proven uh, wrong. Chandler's got that dog in him, which we know he does have that dog in him, but maybe he's that one that goes ham late in the fights. Mm -hmm. And Chandler has been late. He does have more experience there. It's just come a long time ago. Yeah. Um, those fights with Eddie, for example, I believe those all went into the championship rounds. I believe he had some other fights um, over in, in Bellator that went to the championship rounds. So it's not like he hasn't been there. He has more experience there than Charles, but he was also much younger, wasn't 38, wasn't coming off a two-year layoff. Some of the, the potential issues we listed earlier, I don't think those things helped the cardio. Um, and should also note the under-over is one and a half – rounds and it is split dead even um <laughs> almost to pick them so like we're trying to figure out who wins the fourth and fifth round like we're gonna get there yeah. we're we're probably not seeing the start of round four anyways but so i i it's probably not that big of a deal whether we're right or wrong on Oliver having the better cardio it probably will come down to who's gonna finish inside three rounds that's being conservative it's probably who's gonna finish inside to based on the way mm -hmm. that these guys fight so most definitely uh, yeah and um the betting odds for the sub and ko olivero sub plus 130 ko plus 215 so the books have a slight edge on uh, the sub as well but it's nothing you know inside 100 points on two props you know it's not the most what are, what are the odds for what are the odds for the decision for both Oliveira and Chandler. I'm just curious. The Oliveira decision 
is actually the higher of the two. It is plus 1,200. Okay. The Chandler decision is plus 1,100. Okay. That's probably because Chandler does have more decision wins on the record. Yeah. So I imagine that's why he's got the slight edge there. Makes sense. All right. Do you have anything else you want to throw out on this uh, co-main event before we take it over to Bo Nickel and Paul Craig? If it says anything as exciting as the first fight, we're in for a treat, and it's going to be a great. I think this is the most important fight on this card. I know I we, did, we didn't really get into much of the future of John and Stipe, but that'll be a next week's thing, so make sure you tune in for that because we both have very strong feelings, as does Anthony, who I'm sure will be back joining us for that one on that. So look forward to that. But I think this one just in general has the most importance to it. Two guys both looking to get back to a title shot against Islam Mahachev. Seems like he'll be fighting Armin Sarukian in early on in the new year, first quarter for sure. So it opens up an amazing realm of possibility, especially with the way the lightweight division is. I'm here for chaos. This crowd is going to be rocking at the garden. It always is. And when this fight happens and when it finishes – Going into John Jones and Stipe Miocic, oh, it's going to be one hell of a treat. Yeah, they're going to set the stage pretty well, I imagine. And like you said, this is an important fight. The main event obviously has its stakes. It's the consensus greatest of all time versus the consensus greatest heavyweight of all time. That's a, a massive fight from a legacy perspective. This, has, I think, has massive implications on the, a, the lightweight divisions is, if not the premier division, one of the two or three. Um, this has massive implications on the UFC's one of their best divisions, who the champion is going to face next, and who Conor McGregor is going to fight next. As much as maybe Conor doesn't fight again, you know, maybe the winner may just end up parlaying themselves into a year on the sidelines, you know, waiting for Conor. So I think the outcome of this fight is is very important um, for both of these guys, especially when you're looking at a guy like Chandler who. Doesn't have a winning record in the UFC. No. Has not won in several years. His last win came on the day that Charles Oliveira beat Justin Gaethje. So, like, that was a significant amount of time um, for Charles. For, for Charles has done much more in terms of winning in that period of time. So, And I know um, just getting into complete hypotheticals, but if Chandler does lose, do you think he spends another year waiting for Connor? It's a great question. Is, is the Connor fight still on the board? Yeah, that's you know? right. Connor and Nate. Give me a Connor and Nate three. At this it's, point. Like, it's like, what to say? What's to say Connor doesn't go to the Dan Hooker route? What's yeah. to say he doesn't go to the Max Holloway route? What's to say he doesn't? Uh, I guarantee you, Charles Oliveira wins. He calls out Connor McGregor. Connor McGregor. Mm. He's done it for like four times. I even know exactly how he says it. That's how many times he's called them out. Um. So, like, I think this does have a, a long story short. Implications are massive on the coming event. Very, very important fight. So, oh, yeah. it's going to be a fun couple. Uh, what's next as far as the main event and oh. coming event go next week when we're recapping this? Yeah, next There's going to be a lot to talk about, though. Yeah, I mean, hey, we did 48 minutes on the first two fights this week. I think, <laughs> folks, be, ca be, be careful. We really could do <laughs> all over that next week when we're recapping this. Yeah, you might be right. All right. Let's move it over to Paul Craig taking on Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel, the UFC's hot shot prospect, former Penn State wrestler, three-time NCAA national champion, one of the best college wrestlers of all time. I will not say he's the best because I know college wrestling fans will get on you for that. He's not the best out there. There's four-timers out there, and there's some other guys who are better. But as far as uh, current generation goes, he is an elite, elite, elite college wrestler and probably the most popular um, college wrestler that we've seen in a decent chunk of time. Wasn't mm -hmm. able to uh, get into the Olympic trials or wasn't able to make the Olympics, excuse me, because um, he's got great. <laughs> it's American wrestling. If you're not number one, you're uh, you don't get to go. And the guy who's number one, one gold. So he was in a tough spot. And was that, uh, who was that? Was that David Taylor? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, that sends uh, Bo Nickel over to MMA instead of uh, going down the uh, continuous route of trying to beat David Taylor. So now we have him here. 
He's in a fight with Paul Craig, and he is a whopping minus 12,000 favorite. 12,000 or 1,200? 1,200. 1,200. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> 12,000 would be crazy. 12,000, why are we even having this fight? Yeah. And, and I'm putting – if I'm betting on this, I'm putting it on <laughs> Paul Craig in that instinct. <laughs> um. Yeah, minus 1,200. Uh, come back on Paul Craig. Like I said earlier, changes a little bit. There's one site that's got him as a 1,200 favorite that has the plus 650, and there's another one that's got Bo as a minus 1,200 favorite that's got it lined, the comeback on Craig at plus 750. So the sports books can do whatever the hell they want when the favorite's that big. They can throw out whatever price they want. They can throw out as much difference between the two numbers as much as they want. Um, that's sports betting for you. And I think it's justified, you know, maybe he should be minus 800, but you're kind of splitting hairs there. Bo Nickel, massive favorite for a reason. What do you make of uh, Bo Nickel? And do you give Paul Craig any chance here? I want to see Paul Craig win. Not because I don't, not because I'm not a fan. I'm a fan, huge fan of Bo Nichols is now. I think what he's doing is really impressive. I just, for some reason, think it would be so funny that if all people to beat him and end his unbeaten run would be Paul Craig, who has won one of his last five. And you look at the guys who's fought. I'll go from oldest to most recent. July 2022, lost to Vulcan Odesmir decision. Then he started getting into some of the prospects and up-and-coming guys. TKO lost to Johnny Walker. Did get the TKO win against Andre Muniz, but you can't really take much from that, I don't think. The Andre Muniz career has not gone as well as many imagined um, at the same time. Exactly. Then submitted by Brendan Allen. We see where he is now. Knocked out by Kai Borallo. We see where he's getting to as well. The trend says Bo Nickel gets a finish over the aging veteran Paul Craig. I do think Bo will win in the end, but God, the scenes of Paul Craig wins and ends Bo's Realistically, looking at his winning streak outside of that, I mean, I see Olympic trials outside of that. He didn't really lose much in college. Let's just put it that way. He knows how to win. <laughs> He's won in his M- amateur MMA career to start out. So 8 0 in MMA in general, two amateurs, six professional. It would be something for Paul Craig to finish in. Don't think it happens. What do you, <laughs> you might be able to give more of an actual insight into this because i could ramble about the chaos i want to see but there is actually some strategic style on both sides yeah and you know what's also would be a, i am not really like i like bone nickel former wrestler myself so i always have a little bit of love for the guys who are as high level as bone nickel over on the wrestling mat always respect that but if anyone were to beat Bo Nickel, it would be hilarious for it to be Paul Craig, who has mm-hmm. wins over Shogun Hua, albeit Shogun Hua was washed. But he also has wins over Jamal Hill and Megamed Ankalaev. If he can add Bo Nickel's name to his resume, Paul Craig has like actually beaten fighters who are very, very, <laughs> very good at MMA. He has beat them. And like, Jamal Hill, he's not a grappler, but like he went out there, fought Glover to share for 25 minutes, didn't get subbed, didn't get control on the ground for long periods of time. Generally, a good defensive grappler for the light heavyweight division. Magomed Ankalaev is the best offensive grappler in the division that he went out there and submitted. So, like, it's not like these guys are just like, oh, these guys can't grapple anyways. Like, he has submitted some guys with legit grappling skills. Um, but with that being said, I will say you, there's a lot of questions when you're switching over from wrestling to mixed martial arts, everyone has done it differently. <laughs> um, whether it be your Cejudos, whether it be your Cormier's, whoever you want to list, everyone ends up being a little bit different. You saw Cejudo go out there and kind of adapt a karate style, um, and mix in wrestling when he needed it. Cormier was a lot more heavy on his wrestling until he got older. Once he got older. It's, a, it's harder to get takedowns when you're older and your back isn't working very well. Um, and Bone Nickel, I think it 
has done a great job of mixing jujitsu into his offensive wrestling. I still think he's a little bit rough around the edges in terms of the full transition into getting the takedown, setting up the takedown in an MMA, um, on an MMA mat, in an octagon, however you want to phrase it. It's just harder to set up when the dimensions change. You know, you're not wearing shoes. You know, that makes it a little bit harder. You have the fence. There's cage wrestling is a go ahead. I think you don't you don't have gloves like you do in MMA yeah. as well in wrestling. I think that's and that's a whole nother thing we haven't even touched on is they're going back to a different glove. I don't think this is is this the same size that they used at three hundred or are these uh they these started at three oh one. So oh. Bo Nickel has would not has not worn the new gloves. All right. So he's used to these ones so. then. So um, but yeah, I think he's done some, so I think he's a little bit rough around the edges, um, getting the takedown. How do I get to a takedown without getting my head punched into the 12th row? Um, those I think are the bigger concerns with Bo, but once he gets to the ground, I think Bo has taken Brazilian jiu-jitsu very seriously. And I think he's done a great job of implementing that into his game, both from an offensive and defensive perspective. Um, he can go out there and land submissions. Even if the guys he's fighting are not great, he went out there in the contender series and, and rolled to a triangle from top, right? You don't just, if he wasn't comfortable, he wouldn't be putting himself in a in the bottom position. You know what I mean? Like, that's just something you don't do if you're not comfortable. There has to be a level of comfort in the grappling to be willing to roll to the triangle. Because then if you don't get it, you're on your back. And that presents a whole nother list uh, of issues. So, um, I don't think he, like I said, I don't think he's a one all transitioned. I, I, I don't think that yet, but I think he has done, made some really good steps. And now you look at the strategic matchup against Paul Craig, Paul Craig. I just talked about how Bo hasn't, um, really transitioned that great in terms of setting up the takedowns. Well, Paul, you don't have to set up takedowns against Paul Craig. Paul Craig is just going to try to get taken down and fall into his guard when he gets taken down. That's the game plan for Paul Craig. He doesn't really defend the takedown. So um, I, the things I like about Paul Craig are when he gets taken down and gets on top and uses his jiu-jitsu from top. I don't like to lay on my back and throw up the triangle and pray. Um, and that just isn't going to be here against Bo Nickel. Also, like, Paul Craig has some striking skills, but it's like a body kick. Yeah. Bo's going to be the better, more athletic, faster striker. He's probably going to come out here, throw the hands hard and fast, and probably knock Paul Craig out. So that's kind of how I see this fight going. I just think it's for the issues that I currently have with Bo Nichols' MMA game, if I'm being highly critical. I don't think any of those issues are in line to be exposed here. No, and that's the thing. The, that that last part of he has the issues, but they won't be exposed. Paul Craig is, what, 37 years old now, 36 years old. He's not moving very quickly. He has had injuries time and time again, it seems, recently. I don't trust him to survive and not get smacked about. I don't know if he'll get submitted, but I could very well see what you're saying of a Bo Nickel knockout because – I mean, with it being said, it was Val Woodburn who's known for getting knocked out pretty easily that Bo got his one TKO finish in the UFC. Had a couple early on knockout, had one early knockout in his first fight, but it's just one of those things that the youth has a time to come, and we've been seeing this as Paul Craig, against Paul Craig recently. I think he continues, and the way he got finished by Burhalo wasn't exactly the nicest of finishes to say the least he might be shaking some cobwebs off from his trip to rio de janeiro yeah i will also add that paul craig when i was talking earlier going oh he did this against mega Manic alive he did this against jamal hill those were also at like heavyweight and light heavyweight and middleweight are two very different divisions there are a lot of fighters that have fought in both but they're very different when you actually see them in the octagon Light heavyweights are not as good uh, of grapplers. And he has gone down to middleweight, and I don't think he's looked as good at middleweight. And 
you know, I'm, I, in hindsight, probably would have advised them, you know, at the time I, I didn't hate the idea, but now I'm kind of looking back at this going, dude, you look, he looks thin. Like today yeah. at the press conference, for anyone who watched the press conference, this where we recorded this right after, his arms look thin. He looks drained. And I don't think that's helping him at all. The weight cut, he has gone one and two at um, middleweight. And the one win was like a career outlier performance where he got takedowns and got to top position against the guy who gasses out. Um, so I'm not optimistic for Paul Craig's future in this division and that is just another concern on top of everything skills wise and trajectory wise for Bo Nickel. So I also don't like that aspect for Craig. Well so I'm just gonna throw a little respect on Paul Craig here. It's this is a big step up in competition for Bo Nickel, to say the least. It goes from his three UFC fights, Jamie Pickett, Val Wilburn, and then Cody Brundage. This is a big step up in competition. I know he's not the same guy he once was, but he's still been in there. You've already listed off the names he's fought, some of the best guys in that light heavyweight division. He's a seasoned vet, and sometimes the vets do need to get a win, and it's possible, but not probable, to put it that way. Yeah, I will add there's that. A, I was say, there's a reason the odds are as skewed as they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I do agree with what you said. This is a massive step up in competition. Um, Bo is 3-0 in the UFC. All three wins are against ah, buns, bums, basically. Nine UFC level competition. Like, I don't think that any two of the guys, well, no, Jamie Pickett's been cut. Val Woodburn has maybe been cut. At minimum, he went down to 170 and lost and didn't look good. Maybe cut, maybe not cut. Whatever. He's going to get cut eventually. And um, Cody Brundage, it's a miracle he has been in the UFC for as long as he is. And he's stayed around this long by getting DQ wins and no contests so that he hasn't lost enough. So I'm to say, get out of here. You're losing. Um, that's how he's staying in the UFC. And all respect to those guys are UFC fighters. But I do think there's a massive step up in competition from guys who are struggling to hold the UFC roster spot to a guy who has been in the UFC for years um, and has held it down and has never really faced. He went on a win streak. You know, he he's not even on the verge of getting cut. He went on a win streak in the UFC. The level of difference between that and what Bo has fought is tremendously different, even if Paul Craig is not an elite fighter. I will say my only disappointment, and you might know where this is going, for Paul Craig on his UFC resume, is there's one test he never passed. <laughs> at there's a reason he never fought for the belt. It's not because he lost two in a row before moving up to middleweight and two since. He never beat Anthony Smith. That's right. Jason you, know, <laughs> you know what? If this if – this, he was on this run where it went Antigulov win, Shogun win, Jamal Hill win, Nikita Kurlov win. If you slide Anthony Smith in there and not Volkan Uzdemir and he beats Anthony Smith, who knows where the career of Paul Craig would be. Who yeah, knows? Exactly. But it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving down the card, we have the ladies fight on the main card. We have Viviane Araujo versus Karine Silva. This one on the betting line currently sits with Karine Silva as a big favorite. We'll throw out there. It looks like an average is sitting at about minus 270 on the Karine Silva side with Viviane Araujo being plus 230. Um this is a test for Karine Silva, who is one of the prospects that they're trying to build up right now in this flyweight division. We have seen some of these flyweight prospects kind of pass uh, prospect status. At one point, it was Macy Barber, who was the prospect. Now she's a contender. It was Natalia Silva. Now she's graduated. Right. And we've seen, you know, 
not that long ago, we had Manon Fior. I remember when she was Aaron Blanchfield. These were prospects. A lot of these girls have blown past prospect status. Manon Fior is going to fight for the belt. That's how far along they are with that group of prospects. And Karina Silva is kind of the next prospect coming through. And what do we do with a prospect when they're coming through? Give it to our root hole. Yep, that's right. Give her, give her to Vivi. Um, and that's the exact type of fight this is. It's prospect versus veteran. Does the prospect sink? Does the prospect swim? In our Ujo, I wouldn't consider. I don't think she's in her prime, but I don't think she's washed to where it's like this is pointless. Like she's still a tough girl to go out there and beat. So interesting fight. What do you make of uh, Viviane Araujo going out there trying to play gatekeeper against Karine Silva? I mean, you look at who she's fought recently in terms of the Araujo side, and only one of them isn't a prospect who has risen up the rankings. She fought Alexa Grasso. What does Grasso do the next fight? Goes and wins the UFC women's flyweight title. Fair enough. Beat Amanda Hibas, who Amanda Hibas is up and down all over the place. You never know what she's going to show up as. Maybe it was a great night for her. Maybe it was an off night for Araujo. Goes out and beats Jennifer Maya, who is 36 now. Araujo is 37. So it's not like she's fighting a spring chicken anyone. And then Natalia Silva, who you've already talked about, is into that top five, I believe, in the flyweight rankings. Yeah, currently sits at five. I just think this is another one of those fights. I don't think it's going to be the prettiest fight in the world, nothing too crazy, but I do think Karina Silva is on that right tra trajectory. She hasn't lost a fight since May 2019. She's on a nine-fight win streak. Beaten in the UFC, she's beaten Ketlin Souza, Marina Moores, and I mean the other one I recognize is Ariane Lipsky. Who, not notable, notable wins, but still, you're on a hot streak. You're seven years younger. I'm gonna take Silva. I think Silva goes back to back over Arujo. Might be different Silvas, but stay. Yeah, and you know, I like what you brought up. You know, she's undefeated in the UFC, three subs and um, one decision. And she hasn't fought the, you know, toughest level of competition. However, you know, wins over Lipsky and Marina Moroz are like Ketlin Souza's kind of, that's not a tremendous win, but Ketlin Souza has picked up some wins in the UFC. Like, they're, the first girl she fought was a bum. She's yes. fought three fighters who, are holding down roster spots for the time being. Um, Lipsky has been in the UFC for a while. Sills is coming off a, a pretty good win against Haregi. So, like, there's some optimism for the run that she's on. And I love seeing the decision win in the last fight against Lipsky because Karina Silva is going out there and she rips off three first-round wins. And congratulations. That's massive because we don't have a ton of girls who go do that. Mm -hmm. But also, like, that kind of raises red flags to me of, like, well, you can't keep winning fights in the first round. What does your path to victory look like if you had to go to round two? And she won a fight that she had to win by decision that she couldn't finish. And to me, that shows a lot about her cardio. And it's very, very um, important when you're going up against Viviane Araujo, who has never been finished. Um, she... Natalia Silva had her in some bad spots. And I know that because I had Natalia Silva spread minus 3.5. I had Natalia Silva inside the distance. I had Natalia Silva round two KO. Natalia Silva round three KO. And I thought I was going to cash that at certain points. So there was some, there was some hope um, for the Silva backers there that she could get the finish. So I'm not saying it's impossible to finish Viviane Araujo. But I will say it's not an easy task. So I like seeing the, the three-round experience, the win a decision. Um, and I kind of side with Silva for that reason. Our Ujo is another fighter who doesn't have great cardio either. That's why I bet Silva round two and round three KO. Because um, I thought she'd have a decent cardio edge in those rounds. And I think Karina Silva will be the more likely to finish in the first round 
And outside of that, when they both start to slow down, you know, it's not someone who can really expose the other one. And then at that point, I think we're going to decision. We just saw Silva go out there, win the decision in a fight where she was slowing down. So I think um, I'm siding with Silva as well. She's lied to finish it early, but probably going to be a decision is my pick. And I think that's the most likely outcome. Yeah, I'm with you with the decision to Silva. Right. Last fight on the main card. We have Mauricio Ruffy versus James Yantop. Ruffy is a fighting nerd who is 1-0 in the UFC and got a knockout on Contender Series. So that makes him a minus average is probably minus 900 favorite with James Yantop as a plus 600 underdog. And listen, that's a little ridiculous, but Ruffy's a good fighter. I think Ruffy gets the job done. I'm not mm-hmm. as bullish as to whatever the implied probability of minus 900 is. It's a big percentage. I can tell you that. Um, you know, Yan Top is 0-2 in the UFC. I do not think he is a bum. I actually, I didn't pull up the rankings, but I went back and read what I what I said about him coming off the contenders, and I had some hope for him because he has good cardio and he did some good work on the inside. Uh, we didn't see much distance striking from him in that Dana White contender series fight, and that has ended up being a little worse than I anticipated based on the interior striking skills that he showed um and he can't grapple so you know anytime you think somebody's going to be good on contenders and you're like well we didn't see him grapple at all in this fight so i think they're good but i need to see that they can grapple and then you find out they can't grapple at all and you're like well okay well he's bad so we learned that um so ruffy has the um probability to go out there land takedowns if he wants um, but this is probably going to be Ruffy, who's the bigger fighter. He is probably going to sit back, wait to counter strike. And when Yan Top gets aggressive, he's going to counter the shit out of him. That's what uh, Borshev did. Borshev countered the shit out of Yan Top. And um, I think it may be closer than the odds suggest, but I do think it ends with Yan Top landing some massive counter shots and getting the job done so i'm taking roughy round one knockout even if i think the odds are disgusting i'm with you i mean you look at his fights 10 and 1 all 11 fights have been a ko or a tko it doesn't last very long only one of them has gone to a third round and that was his dana white contender series fight since then i was Kind of high-ish on Jamie Mullarkey. I thought he was just one of those other Australian guys that was going to come up and be really good. He got put to sleep in the first round of UFC 301. I like Mauricio Ruffy. I think he gets it done in that first round. KO as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Mullarkey's a bad um, first win in the lightweight division. Um, I'll also add on the Ruffy side, I went back and read my my Ruffy um, contender series as well wasn't as high on Ruffy as the consensus and one of the reasons for that is I thought he was a small welterweight well now he's a lightweight so that concerns out the window and a lot more optimistic for him when you're playing when he you when you rely on straight shots as much as he does I was like I don't know how well this translates when you're consistently going to be smaller now all of a sudden you're bigger than everybody because you drop down the division and it's like oh well now I see the vision so um optimistic down rough roughy and think he's going to be better than um, my prediction for him coming off the ultimate fighter was and um he also beat a uh dagestani wrestler to get into the ufc so he kept kept a uh habib associate out of the ufc which i think is a service <laughs> thank you thank you rough all right hey, so. that is <laughs> that is every fight on the main card of UFC 309. And like I said at the top of the show, we're not going to go crazy in depth and detail on the prelims because we would be here all night long. Um, but we will do some final thoughts because this is a pay per view and these pay per views don't have terrible prelims. I wouldn't consider anything on the prelims earth shattering by any means, but 
there are some notable fights on the prelims. Uh, Jerry, anything that stands out to you when you're looking at these prelims, whether it be a fight, a fighter, a matchup, however you want to tackle the final thought? I really have just three guys I want to shout out that I'm curious to see how they look. Two of them, old veteran guys who are still hanging around. Chris Weidman taking on Eric Anders. Don't really know what to expect in that one. It's kind of what version of is he of Weidman is going to show up. Other one, Jim Miller. He got pieced up pretty badly in his last fight at UFC 300 against um, Bobby Green. See how he returns here. And then the one who I am excited about on the other side of things, Oban Elliott. I really enjoyed watching his last fight. He started to look really good. And the fight before he fought Val Woodburn, who we mentioned a little earlier ago, isn't anything special. But beat Preston Parsons, and I think he looked really good doing so. I'm excited to see what this young Welsh kid has going into his next fight against, why am I blanking? Basil, Basil Hafez. Basilefest. Yeah, so some similars. Chris Weidman. Hey man. <laughs> this would be a great time to retire. I'm just saying. <laughs> UFC 309, yeah. pay-per-view, New York. It's got all the makings of a retirement fight. Um Jim Miller. I'm really interested to see what Jim Miller looks like. Um against Damon Jackson. And Damon Jackson's a guy that I am uh I don't know if I'm not a fan of him or if I really, really like betting against him. Um, I do really like betting against him. That has yielded me some money, and it has taken some money. I think I'm about even, but just about every fight I find myself betting against Damon Jackson. It all started with Dan Ige. I bet Dan Ige did knock him out, and Dan Ige knocked him out, and I was like, well, I'm just going to keep riding this. He gets hit terribly bad in every fight. I'm going to keep betting against him. Um, and guess what I'm going to do this weekend? Jim Miller? You're old, but you can still hit hard. Let's let's get Damon Jackson on the on the chin. Give me plus one fifty. It's a fair trade in my book. So, um, sure. I'm probably more excited about that fight than other people, just for my tendency to bet on Miller and against Jackson. So that's my Super Bowl. Um, the and people's, then, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the James Herrick main event. <laughs> <laughs> um. Marcin Tabro, Janata Denise, also a very important fight for that heavyweight division. Um, almost as important as the main event. Um, but Janata Denise, a prospect that they're trying to build, had Derek Lewis had to pull out of his fight against Denise. Now he's in there with Marcin Tabro, which is a test from a stylistic perspective. You know, there's a chance Denise just goes out there, bang, one, two. Wins the fight by knockout. But I'm interested to see what Denise looks like if he is tested in the grappling phases. To me, that is a my big question about Denise as a prospect. And if he can pass a grappling test against Tabura, I'll be more optimistic about his future. If he knocks him out without grappling at all, I'll be like, well, all right, that's kind of well, the, the expectation. Yeah. But if he's tested in the grappling and passes, I'll tip my hat to him. And then my last one to shout out. David Onama versus Roberto Romero. Um, David Onama is a guy who is borderline must watch television. Great fight against Nate Landwehr. When he's not in great fights, he's usually just absolutely killing people. Um, he went out there, I believe it was Mason Jones. I believe that's what, yeah. The decision against Mason Jones that he lost was a great fight. Mason Jones is a great fighter who is no longer in the UFC, who asked to be cut so he could fight in Cage Warriors and get better. So credit to mason jones for doing what he thinks is best for his career um but point being you know that was a great fight and then he goes out there tko then he submits garrett armfield with his aged beautifully nate landwehr ridiculously good fight then he goes out there sends gabriel santos to the shadow realm with an uppercut and went over jsp after that um didn't finish jsp but you know, when you're dealing with the grappling of JSP, if you beat him, I'm not going to complain too much. It's not an easy fight for anybody. So, David on Onama, pretty good television. Uh, as for Mr. Roberto Romero, he was signed to the UFC this week in order to keep David Onama on the card. So, sometimes these guys who are 8-3, 8-3-1, 24 years old, 
he's either going to suck, and David Onama is going to have his head in the upper deck of Madison Square Garden, or he's going to be like much better than you'd expect and surprise people. So those fights always intrigue me. I lean towards the first option, but um, I'm going to watch and find out. So those are the the prelims that kind of stand out to me. All pretty good fights, in my opinion. I believe those are all the three that I listed off are all back to back to back. So get your uh, get your wings or get your pizza before those three. So don't want to the Onana one. I'm curious because he is such a big favorite. He's also four inches taller. I'm just pulling up some stats on him. So we'll see what this 24 year old can do. It'd be cool to see another youngster get going. And but <laughs> if he doesn't, we know Nana's going to put on a show one way or another. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think someone. I don't think this goes the distance. Let's put it that way. I agree. Um, David Onama minus nine hundred as well. So a lot of big favorites on this card and. Yeah, one of one of them's got to win, right? One of them, whether it be Steep Steep A, Paul Craig, James Yon Top, Robert Romero. Those are just saying. One of them's got to get it done. One of them's got to hit. It's Uh, UFC. Something crazy always happens, and Madison Square Garden's nothing unlike anything. (laughs) Yeah, Madison Square Garden cards get crazy. so. So, um. Thank you to everyone who tuned in for an hour and 20 minutes to listen to us talk about fights. Um, hope you enjoyed. And like we mentioned earlier, we're going to be back next week with a recap. We'll talk about the fights, what happened in the fights, and our opinions on what is coming next. And the what is coming next portion is going to be a fun one, just based off what we have in the main event and co-main event. And also, Dana White said that he is going to announce the UFC 310 main event. I believe he said tomorrow. Um, So Friday or maybe he said Saturday after the fights. UFC 310 main event coming soon. And once you get the UFC 310 main event out, then you're live for that 311 announcement any day. So we may have some news as well next week. So um, I do want to throw one, one thing out there. Yep. Just out of curiosity, I looked to see what the main, what last year's Madison Square Garden card was. And here's what we had. In the main card, the five fights. First round knockout. First round knockout. Second round knockout. First round knockout. Second round knockout. We may be in for another treat, folks. I don't think do you so. Want to know what happened, do you want to know what happened the time before they went, when they went to Madison Square Garden? Decision. Decision. I think I thought it was all finishes as well. Oh, it I thought was. the card before that yeah, was all finishes. You're right. You're right. It was. The eighth, the last eight fights were all finishes. So, so oh. Madison Square Garden, and we got the old gloves back. The new glove uh, with the new gloves that are now the old gloves um, that are now in the trash. Uh, the finishing rates did drop. I don't know if it's technically a significant sample size or not, but the finish rates yeah. with the old gloves were higher. So, if we get finishes, Just I mean, it's Square Garden. <laughs> yeah um so it should be a good card just from an entertainment perspective as well which always love that uh for the ufc so uh, make sure you tune in next week and shout out to vendorswitchmedia.com that's obviously where we write our articles that's where the podcast is hosted you can go to vendorswitchmedia.com to check out the website which will have preview with my picks jerry's picks Anthony's picks, Garrett's picks, the whole crew. And there will be a best bet article out as well. So we're going to go in depth on all the main card fights there, predictions, and then just pure betting angle as well with with that. Um, And Vendetta Fantasy Contest as well just launched for the site. It is a, a, basically, it's for fantasy contests. Give a group of buddies. You don't bet real money. You bet coins and it's basically a competition with you and your buddies five dollar entry fee it is a good way to make some bets without throwing down um too much real money you only got to put five dollars on the line and you can have a competition with your buddies and you set the rules can be public or private that is vendetta fantasy contest and that is up live don't have ufc up yet so you're out of luck on ufc 309 but other sports are up there nfl 
NBA, soccer, and more. So check that out as well. Those are all the plugs. Like, subscribe, and we will see you next week.